feel like it is like too extended so you can just uh, stop me no i will it you can take all the time of the world ma'am I mean, these lectures are so for why was just telling sort about that, that uh, he makes sure that uh, all of you are so phenomenal and wonderful in the way you present ma'am you can take as much time you want because uh, in any case these will be viewed on youtube uh, after uh, this session is over online so ma'am it's okay i mean of course i will keep a track of time but ma'am i'm sure that it will never exceed um anyone's patients <laughs> no ma'am I'm, i'm telling you i mean that's what i've been following these lectures they are um, absolutely enriching and in every possible way so ma'am you please teach us all that you want to do there <laughs> so should we start sir uh, just one question sir where do i access the questions that will be typed you don't, uh, you don't sorry uh, you can get them on the chat and on the youtube ones i will type it on the chat all right sir all i'll right. help you out no problem all right sir all right so all all set manita should we start yes i'm ready right so we'll start right. Uh, good evening everybody welcome to this evening episode of pursue and this is pursue 13c which is head and neck pathology and we are streaming live from tmh mumbai via kolkata and we have a very eminent pathologist and a very dynamic pathologist to moderate the session so let me introduce the moderator and she will introduce the pathologist who is going to speak so the moderator is dr sanjuti das gupta she is an md dnb and associate professor in the department of pathology in the famous medical college kolkata she has done her senior residency from esi manikthala and then after that she has been all through in the medical college a very well known pathologist of calcutta with multiple publications in national and international journals i would hand over to dr sanjuti das gupta to introduce the speaker sanjuti please take over thank you so much sir um, good evening everyone uh, first of all um, i would like to thank nadim sir for um, this platform for arranging this platform for us i'm sure this neelam path lectures it has become like a box of treasures for all the trainees as well as for the practicing pathologists so thank you so much sir and um, today's session is the third one as sir has just mentioned it uh, about uh, head neck pathology it's pursue 13c and the topic is recent entities and interesting cases in head and neck and it is my honor to introduce the speaker for the session dr munita meenu bal she is the professor <coughs> department of pathology tmh mumbai she is onco pathology co chair eurasian federation of oncology russia she is also the visiting professor for md pathology pg teaching in department of pathology kasturba medical college manipal she is an expert on icmr consensus documents for pancreatic cancer gastroenterocardial pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and hepatocellular carcinoma she is a working group member of national cancer grid she is the editor of the book entitled crossing of surgical oncology specimens tmh she is the author of several book chapters she is on the editorial board of pancreatic cancer india she is also on the national advisory board of igmpo she has won several awards including best presentation award in kddw 2019 seoul south korea she has numerous national and international publications and her special interests are head neck pathology and gi pathology ma'am we are absolutely delighted to have you here this evening so with that i would like to request dr munita bal to please begin her presentation over to you ma'am thank you thank you so much sanjuti for such an elaborate uh, and kind introduction and uh, thank you very much dr nadeem uh, for inviting me uh, to for today's session uh, without much ado i would like to uh, go to the session Yeah, we can see your presentation. Yeah, just make it full screen. Yeah. 
Okay, so good evening everybody. Uh, I'll be covering a topic uh, of recent entities and interesting cases of head neck region. Uh, you will find that uh, a bit of this has been covered previously by in previous lectures. But uh, I believe uh, when the entities are recently described and they are rare and uncommon, uh, it, it is never uh, too much to see them again and again. Uh, I hope you would find uh, something new in these presentations also. Uh, some of the non-pathology images which I have taken for educational purposes or to emphasize a point has been from internet. Um, so if we look at first I go to the Sinolaser site. Uh, if you look at most of the head and neck sites, uh, uh, the commonest malignancy in more than 90% of the cases is squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, the, the resident brings the case and in head and neck and he feels that it's going to be a squamous carcinoma by default. In contrast, if you look at the sinonasal and the skull-based pathology, uh, you per cubic uh, meter you find of the of cyanonasal mucosa you find the greatest diversity uh, of uh, lesions and neoplasms in comparison to any other part of the body. So cyanonasal uh, pathology is extremely uh, interesting because it is diverse and also a lot of uh, progress has been made uh, in this uh, in the in the pathology of cyanomasal lesions in the recent past which makes it even more exciting and also provides us a perspective to uh, where a lot of old entities uh, which we routinely see uh, with the, these new uh, entities which are being described uh, we need a newer perspective and have to have a, a relook at the entities which we think are routine and common and uh, we may be actually dealing with something which is new. Uh, so uh, with that I begin with the case one. Uh, today I just brought uh, a bunch of cases uh, from the various head neck regions and hopefully, hopefully we'll enjoy them. Uh, so the case one is a 29 year old woman with rapidly enlarging mass in the heart palate. Uh, she had exophthalmos at presentation and blurred vision. And that was the only history we had. And uh, the tumor, this is the lining uh, mucosa. And here we see that the whole subepithelium is uh, showing the blue tumor, a tumor which is uh, having anastomos intravically of these blue uh, cells. Um, and if we look at the high power, we find that these cells are quite monotonous. They are undifferentiated. When we look at a hard palate mass, we are looking for some, uh, some differentiation and most common we would expect is some, somewhere it would show a squamous differentiation. But if we see this is a tumor which is wall to wall showing same type of cells and the cells don't look pretty bland, they look uh, they are vesicular opened up nuclei, have prominent nucleoli, and uh, there are uh, a lot of mitotic figures as well. So it does have a kind of a monotonous but undifferentiated appearance. Uh, here you have some cohesion, of, of some attempted uh, uh, differentiation in the form of increased cytoplasm, but not much glue. And I scan the stroma here. Uh, and then we find uh, there is some focus where you, to our relief, we find that there is some squamous differentiation, and which uh, seems that the suddenly the cells are becoming abruptly keratinized, and uh, suddenly they have chosen to reveal the differentiation. But if we see in contrast to this keratinized focus or this uh, squamous focus, the rest of the cells uh, do not show any any. Uh, uh, great gradation in their maturation, they are all uniformly monotonous and undifferentiated in appearance. Uh, we do A1, A3 and we find which is a cytokeratin, uh, we find this is uh, positive in this tumor cells and we do P40 uh, which is a marker for basal marker and more specifically a squamous marker and we see that the, all the tumor cells are nearly diffusely and strongly positive, it's a nuclear marker. So this is a histology, this is the histology, this is a poorly differentiated looking tumor or undifferentiated looking tumor with squamous differentiation and uh, showing diffuse uh, uh, P40 positivity which is a squamous marker. So it's a squamous carcinoma, right? So in, in some olden days, uh, a couple of years ago, we would have without a thought 
called it commerce cards no more because that's what we have been taught that uh, we have been trained for that if it's a poorly differentiated malignant tumor you look for a focus of differentiation and uh, here we find there is commerce differentiation and it's good enough to call it commerce cards no more but uh the clinic clinical history if we see is nothing like a regular uh, squamous cell carcinoma the uh, the growth in the tumor uh, in the patient uh, had been rapid within weeks it had grown and destroyed there had been acts of thalamus that the tumor was literally coming out of the eye and there was intracranial extension as well and the clinical feedback was that this was a highly aggressive uh, tumor and uh, we and looking at this abrupt round cell appearance uh, with uh, with abrupt sorry undifferentiated round cell appearance and an abrupt keratinization we uh, used the ic for not uh, which was strongly and diffusely uh, positive in all the nuclei of the tumor cells so this was diagnosed as a not carcinoma and what is this not carcinoma uh, not stands for nuclear protein and testes which was formerly this entity was called as a not midline carcinoma because uh, most of the tumors that were earlier described were in the midline in the synonasal and mediastinal location uh, thereafter many other sites uh, laterally placed uh, salivary glands and other locations have been reported uh, so the 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 term midline has been dropped and now it is uh, uh, referred to as a not carcinoma uh, thankfully we have an immunohistochemistry which is highly uh, sensitive and very specific has a 100% specificity and uh, this ic is seen as nuclear speckled um, uh, positivity and um, this uh, carcinoma important to know is a translocation uh, induced carcinoma most of the carcinomas like in comparison to squamous carcinoma which is conventional you have a lot of chromosomal gains and losses uh, whereas here there is a single translocation uh, which leads to this kind of uh, monotonous appearance and abrupt keratinization uh, so there is suspension of uh, maturation of these tumor cells and this is caused by translocation of uh, 15 19 translocation where uh, there is a fusion of not prd4 and the part Partners of not uh, may change, but the most common is BRD4. Uh, so I'll show you some of the cases uh, from our uh, uh, hospital. The, this is another uh, case which shows these kind of monotonous cells. And if you see, uh, if this is a biopsy from the synonasal location showing no differentiation, uh, we would call uh, on morphology as uh, synonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. So these are basically uh, microscopically very undifferentiated, but uh, you have a lot of mitosis here readily identifiable and the nuclei uh, they are not bland looking they are although they are monotonous but they are very undifferentiated with prominent nuclei so another area or another case where we have tumor cells which sort of uh, show a very monotonous population of cells another case if you see that there is an abrupt squamous keratinization which is quite an important diagnostic clue uh, and uh, the background cells show uh, blue round cells which uh, at places are compressed and stretched out and appear spindle so it depends where your biopsy is uh, uh, what what part of the uh, tumor you land with if the needle is in a round cell area then you may come call it a round cell tumor you may start working it up as a round cell tumor uh, but if you find a nice uh, a focus of keratinization abrupt abruptly placed within the sea of monotonous round cells then that's a very important morphologic clue to think beyond a regular squamous cell carcinoma or a round cell tumor so keratinization i've been showing you is a focal abrupt but in some cases it can be uh, quite extensive and those are the cases which uh, which will be which are likely to be called as squamous cell carcinoma and you may not suspect it this is one such case which was called as squamous cell carcinoma and uh, when I, when this the clinical feedback was given that this is highly aggressive uh, not antibody was done and it was found to be uh, diffusely positive and that was what was uh, quite uh, shocking to us 
So here you have uh, another area. This is a tumor which can be called as you can think of a sinonasal neuroendocrine carcinoma, or you can think of any other round cell tumor or even melanoma. So, uh, so in, depending upon what you've got, uh, your uh, you may start thinking that this you may not suspect not. Uh, so it is essential that when you have a round cell or an undifferentiated tumor in a sinonasal location, uh, and not immunohistochemistry should be kept at hand, preferably in the initial panel, but you may do it after a one a 3 or B40 is positive. So uh, here is uh, another case. Uh, here you so sometimes, with the, depending upon the stroma, the cells can be stretched out. You can see this is like any other round cell tumor or a synovial sarcoma as well as a differential rhabdoid synovial. And then you see an area where there is a uh, appearance of uh, an epithelial differentiation. Another area again, if you can appreciate, this is uh, too bright a photograph, but. Uh, uh, an island of round cells and within it you can see a single isolated uh, keratinized cell. Here also there is a hint of uh, keratinization of individual cells. Um, another area, which, another case which is showing a round cell appearance, it can look like a lymphoma or earrings. Another case which can look like earrings and lymphoma. So this is the whole spectrum. It can look like uh, a round cell tumor on one hand and a poorly differentiated uh, uh, basal or squamous cell carcinoma on the other hand. And there are other differentials uh, that we will come, uh, we will see all along the way. So A1, A3 is uh, usually positive. These are tumors which are keratin positive. And in a vast majority of cases, they will be positive for P40. Or if you don't have P40, you can do P63. These are markers. Uh, so if you are thinking of uh, squamous cell carcinoma and this kind of morphology you see, uh, and the tumor is clinically quite aggressive, it is a good idea to go ahead and perform that immunohistochemistry. It's a very good clone now, C52B1 clone, which is quite specific uh, from cell signaling. And uh, it shows a nice nuclear positivity. Usually the positivity is quite speckled. Um, earlier, we had to send our cases uh, to Dr. French, who maintains a registry of, to confirm by fish. But uh, with this good antibody, uh, and if you have a diffuse positivity at least of more than 50%, we can call this uh, very confidently as uh, not uh, carcinoma. So these tumors, uh, if we see, have been previously diagnosed as poorly differentiated squamous, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas or SNUCs, even sarcomas, nasopharyngeal carcinomas, uh, any sort of malignant round cell tumor, germ cell tumors and leukemias. Uh, so this I have already spoken about. If you look at the uh, uh, not carcinoma IC spectrum, then usually it is A1, A3 and P63 positive. P40 is positive. They have CD34 positivity. And I1 or smart B1, uh, which you'll be familiar with by now, if you be lectures, then that is retained in these cases. And we'll see how it is important to, uh, to differentiate it from other uh, differential diagnosis. Two, uh, not carcinomas are negative for MIG2 or CD99 and KX2.2, which, which is a good marker for even sarcoma. S100 or SOX10, which is a marker for melanomas, or which can help distinguish in this setting from melanoma, and neuroendocrine markers, synaptophysin and chromogranin, because many of these tumors can look like uh, uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas uh, in, a, in a small biopsy. So the, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, nut carcinoma is, uh, has undifferentiated round cell appearance, abrupt keratinization. If you see these features, morphologic features, uh, it's a good idea to do nut IC and go ahead and confirm with it. Um, so um, the theory part has already been covered, uh, I believe, in the previous lecture. So my uh, my emphasis would be mostly on morphology, uh, how we can pick up uh, clues from morphology, a simple HNA, and and uh, and see if we can work our way to confirmation of diagnosis. So case two. 
uh, is a 48 year old female who presented with intermittent episodes of epistaxis uh, on MRI. There was a well defined lobulated non enhancing soft tissue density mass, uh, which was huge uh, 9.5 centimeters in the left nasal cavity. And after a debulking surgery, we received the tissue blocks. And uh, if you look at this picture, this is uh, something that you can show a resident on the, in the first year and they will be able to remember forever because it's so characteristic. This, this kind of uh, crudely formed pattern with this bluish material and these blue cells with that related dye. So it's a very beautiful uh, looking uh, histology which is very easy to, which, which is quite impressionable. And most of us can very easily make this diagnosis of adenoid cystic carcinoma. So this is again a tumor which is showing nice uh, morphology, cribriform morphology, uh, lots of cribriform architecture with these uh, and the tumor cells are essentially basaloid in appearance and rounded. Uh, and if you look at many areas, they have these kind of annotated nuclei. And usually, most of the areas look unproblematic and a typical adenoid cystic carcinoma with this typical characteristic bluish material. So, this is adenoid cystic carcinoma, right? How can this be anything else? So, if you see, then, then we find that there are areas where the, these, this tumor is quite cheated in appearance and quite solid in appearance. So is this a solid adenoid cystic carcinoma? So if we have more than 30% solid areas in adenoid cystic carcinoma, then some people grade it as grade 3 adenoid cystic carcinomas. And uh, these are, those are believed to be much more aggressive associated with lymph node metastasis and distant metastasis whereas uh, let's see if and but we see that there are a lot of these dark spots whether these are mitosis and we do find indeed these are mitosis and the tumor cells are looking much more sheeted and uh, there are a whole sheet of solid sheet diffuse pattern of these tumor cells with a lot of mitosis this is something which is quite unusual for adenoid cystic carcinoma a typical conventional adenoid cystic carcinoma it's very hard to find any any uh, real mitosis um, and then we see that the whole uh, surface epithelium is sort of dysplastic and showing uh, it's difficult to say whether it's a pegetoid spread or it is just dysplastic but the surface uh, this is something very unusual for adenoid cystic carcinoma to do and uh, so this is odd sheeted appearance is on and so a tumor which is adenoid cystic like and having these abnormal features like sheeted, sheeted diffuse architecture with a, a much increased mitosis and surface involvement is this really adenoid cystic carcinoma and then we do uh, immunohistochemistry, a regular adenoid cystic carcinoma you, we hardly do immunohistochemistry because the image is so striking um, because adenoid cystic carcinoma is composed of ductal uh, and myopithelial cells. So for ductal cells, we have CK7 or EMA. And we can see there is some positivity in some of the tumor cells. And uh, P40 and the myopithelial component of adenoid cystic carcinoma is positive, can be positive with a whole lot of myopithelial cells. Including here we can see P40 and P63, they are positive. And these are those solid areas where there are uh, more solid and sheeted appearance with some from areas here and these tumor cells are do, are indeed showing ductal and myopithelial differentiation. CK is uh, known to be positive in vast majority, in large majority, large number of cases of adenoid cystic carcinoma, although I would emphasize it is not specific for a diagnosis of uh, for adenoid cystic carcinoma because Many salivary gland tumors and non-salivary gland tumors uh, can show CK positivity. But on the other hand, um, most of the adenoid cystic carcinomas will be positive for CK. So it doesn't make a diagnosis, but if it is negative, you start wondering, is it really adenoid cystic carcinoma? But there will be some uh, cases which will be negative for CK as well. 
but it is most of uh, in, during your residency you feel very reassured if some tumor is CK positive. So, uh, so we have to uh, take it with a pinch of salt. But this tumor is so far behaving like adenoid cystic carcinoma. It does show some SNA positivity also or small muscle actin which can highlight some blood vessels as well as the myopithelial cells. So it, this tumor is showing features like adenoid cystic carcinoma. It has gribriform areas, ductal myopithelial phenotype on immunohistochemistry. But then it does have um, uh, features which are unlike a conventional adenoid cystic carcinoma, uh, showing a pagetoid surface involvement or surface dysplasia and, and, uh, and increased mitosis. So, so we went ahead and did E16, which is uh, a marker we which if we all uh, are aware, is a surrogate marker for HPV or human papilloma virus uh, infection in the oropharyngeal site. Uh, but this uh, tumor is in the heart palate or is it in the maxilla, in the sinonasal location. So where P16 cannot be uh, uh, taken as a surrogate for HPV, we do not have enough data. But if we see uh, this tumor, Adenoid cystic carcinoma is showing diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity for P16. Now, P16 is a, is a, is a component of cell cycle. It's a cell cycle protein uh, and it's expressed at various phases of cell cycle. And in, so it is expressed in a whole lot of uh, tumors and normal uh, epithelium. And if you see uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma, the conventional ones, also express P16, but the pattern of positivity is actually either ductal or luminal, but it's never diffused. So if diffuse in adenoids, uh, raise your and so thirty percent. In pharynx, this has been found to be a reasonable data. And here, we, because it's a sign of location, we had to perform some specific genotyping for the HP, and we found that this patient had uh, HPV uh, type 52, which was positive. So, this tumor was positive for HPV. So what we did, there have been papers uh, uh, which have uh, described uh, in the sinonasal location, uh, which uh, appearance and they are associated with HPV uh, uh, positivity. So these tumors were earlier called as adenoid cystic like carcinomas, HPV positive or HPV related adenoid cystic like carcinomas. But now uh, with the expanding uh, spectrum, um, it, they are now termed as a human papilloma virus related multiphilogypic cytomegalus. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, elegant descriptions come from uh, the series by uh, Justin Bishop, and uh, he has described a whole spectrum of uh, HPV-like, uh, HPV-related uh, multiphenotypic uh, sinonasal carcinoma, starting in his in his initial series with adenoid cystic-like features, uh, where uh, where uh, these kind of solid patterns. Uh, this kind of bluish appearance with irregular infiltrating areas, uh, palisading, and these uh, morpho morphologic spectrum was seen. So this is a new entity, uh, which is very interesting because it shows this HPV-related uh, uh, features as well as has salivary gland-like features. So here we are not talking about a squamous morphology or some histology which we see in old pharynx, which is squamous uh, and HPV-related. Here we have a tumor which is salivary gland-like, has salivary gland-like features and is HPV-related. 
and it is very uniquely described in the Sinonese tract. Um, uh, important clues are they tend to show farmers' differentiation, surface dysplasia, and perhaps intratumoral dysplasia as well, solid growth pattern, and presence of HPV. Most commonly described in this location are 33, and there are others as well. Um, so P16, uh, I'd say, can help us. Uh, by con it consistently shows diffuse and strong cytoplasmic staining, and you see that the myopithelial markers are also positive, unlike the squamous carcinoma. Uh, here, the myopithelial markers are positive. Here, the squamous markers are also positive. And um, if we, if you are familiar, then MYB. Uh, fusions are seen in a conventional advanced cystic carcinoma and uh, uh, MYB fusions mostly are negative in this entity when they can be positive. More data is coming up uh, but uh, but as of now we, we I mean, and INI1 or SMART B1 is retained. So, so very interesting entity which is positive for, uh, I'm sorry this is uh, squamous markers and myopithelial markers. So, so adenoid cystic carcinoma can can uh, uh, there can be tumors which can look like adenoid cystic carcinoma and maybe something totally different. Um, another uh, jumping onto another case which uh, of adenoid cystic carcinoma. So, well, is this an adenoid cystic carcinoma? Uh, well, this looks pretty regular adenoid cystic carcinoma, and if you see here. Uh, we see conventional uh, cribriform pattern, uh, ductal and luminal, ductal myopithelial differentiation. But if you look at this side uh, towards the right side, we find there is suddenly necrosis, and uh, and there appears to be some large duct-like uh, structures with some uh, uh, atypical appearing or tumorphic appearing epithelium. And then we see that again, this is adenoid cystic like areas or adenoid cystic, which is uh, which is a regular conventional adenoid cystic. And then we have uh, suddenly the tumor becoming uh, more more anaplastic or more having more cytologic atypia, and uh, almost uh, showing features of hybrid. Uh, carcinoma or hybrid adenocarcinoma. So this is a tumor where a hybrid uh, adenocarcinoma is juxtaposed to a conventional low-grade adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma. So there and here we have tumor. Which there is a component which showing greater uh, positive in the lymphatic cells and P uh, here is highlighting the myopithelial here uh, if you look at it come 67 or the convention is whereas in the in the animal person areas it is really short. This is an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Oh your voice is just what you say I should shut I think there's mind. some internet issues at your end because it's uh, the voice is coming and going. Oh, that is, uh, I can shut off my video. Maybe that yeah. would be better. No, now your better? voice is clear. Yeah, no, it's better. It's absolutely yeah. better. It's clear. Yeah, now it's clear. Sorry, please go ahead. Okay. So do you, do you want me to go back and repeat of the portions? Uh, yeah, or you should continue? just put three slides back. That would be better. Okay, so I can uh, go back to this case and show that this is adenoid which is adenoid cystic, a regular adenoid cystic. In the, in the top half you can see, or the or the top uh, left you can see, there is an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Whereas in the, the lower right half, see that the tumor has a it, 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 central necrosis. 
And the uh, area which shows a conventional cystic carcinoma in this area, whereas there is a high grade cytology and a more infiltrative adenocarcinoma on the right upper side. So, so there are there is a tumor which is showing low grade adenoid cystic carcinoma juxtaposed to a high grade adenocar adenocarcinoma. So this is uh, so there are there are, there are areas in the tumor which are showing regular conventional low grade adenoid cystic carcinoma, whereas the adenocarcinoma or the high grade area are hardly recognizable as adenoid cystic carcinoma. They have lost the features of adenoid cystic carcinoma and show high grade cytology as well as glandular differentiation and this is reflected in the immunohistochemistry as well where we see uh, the the this half uh, the the left half the, um, uh, differentiation highlighted by the uh, component CK7 positive button cells, whereas P63 is highlighting the peripheral, uh, uh, the myopithelial cells, whereas in the glandular component, there's marked uh, reduction in the P63 of the myopithelial cells. In the KI67, which is a proliferation marker, you find that the adenoid cystic conventional has a very low uh, KI67, whereas in the high grade, component you have very high uh, ki67 labeling so this you can case make it full uh, screen. You can make it full screen. it's not the full you can make, okay yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry for you. interrupting sorry for interrupting yeah. no problem no problem uh, so again, we see an area of uh, where here you have a more of a solid pattern of adenoid cystic carcinoma where you have solid nests, but they still are recognizable with their uh, angulated nuclear contours. And then there is a juxtaposition by an adenocarcinoma, which is showing higher grade uh, cytology with increased mitosis. So uh, again, adenoid cystic, another case with adenoid cystic morphology, more tubular pattern, whereas the adenocarcinoma component and uh, shows uh, features which are not uh, recognizable as adenoid cystic carcinoma like a conventional ad adenocarcinoma. So high, this is a phenomena of high-grade transformation which is uh, observed rarely in salivary gland uh, uh, and most common histology in which this is seen is the adenoid cystic carcinoma and the most common location among all salivary gland locations is the sinonasal location. So this is a phenomena which is under recognized. We only uh, try to identify or focus on the path on the conventional adenoid cystic carcinoma, but it would be, uh, it is important to look at the whole, all the slides and see that there is not, uh, there is no area which is showing high grade transformation uh, because when once this high grade transformation occurs, uh, there is an increased um, aggressive behavior, there is increased nodal and distant metastasis. So this is a phenomena, if we are aware, then we'll start, we, we can adequately sample especially salivary gland tumors uh, in the in the sinonasal location and this phenomena is not only seen with adenoid cystic carcinoma but also reported with the uh, epithelial myopithelial carcinoma secretory carcinoma or mask and uh, many other carcinomas and it is possible with uh, with all the, any of the salivary gland histology uh, so awareness of this phenomena is important and the, uh, another diagnostic feature which is very important is to identify uh, a, a very important uh, or a very uh, uh, co the conventional or a low grade uh, salivary gland uh, component has to be present. So we cannot just say that this is if we find adenocarcinoma that this might be adenocarcinoma transformations from a from an adenoid cystic, you have to uh, identify or recognize uh, presence of low-grade uh, component to call something as high-grade transformation. So going to the case three, this is a 65-year-old male with nasal mass. Uh, we get these fragments and these fragments are composed of these solid uh, sheets of, uh, again, what we can say is undifferentiated appearing cells. There are some dilated blood vessels, but apart from that, you have sheets of very uh, undifferentiated or epithelioid appearing cells. Again, area which where they are much more closely packed, there is hardly any stroma. But the tumor looks quite pink uh, in appearance at this part, unlike the tumors, uh, unlike the 
blue tumor that we first saw. Uh, again, here we find uh, we are trying to look for differentiation in this poorly differentiated or undifferentiated tumor, and it is hard to find. And what instead we find are tumor cells which have a rhabdoid uh, kind of an appearance, and which is more apparent in this uh, focus where you have uh, opened up vesicular nuclei, uh, prominent nucleoli, and an eccentrically placed um, uh, nucleus with uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm, giving a rhabdoid appearance. So most of the cells in this field are rhabdoid in appearance, and they have this uh, the increased mitosis. No other uh, differentiation is identified in other closer view to show these uh, rhabdoid cells. And that is a very, very important clue in this case because here we can see a lot of rhabdoid cells and uh, again another uh, slide where they show this kind of fried egg appearance and uh, again rhabdoid morphology we do cytokeratins and a1a3 uh, which is uh, broad spectrum cytokeratin is positive and uh, p40 is positive so a couple of years ago we would have called this basaloid squamous carcinoma or a very poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma based on this diffuse positivity for p40 um, but now based on the newer uh, developments we do ini1 or smart p1 and here we find that the whole tumor is negative the tumor cells are negative and only the internal control in the form of endothelial cells or stromal cells is positive so this is the tumor which is showing a loss of smart b1 or i1 and uh, hence it is called it is now defined as a smart p1 i1 deficient carcinoma sinonasal carcinoma and uh, now i1 or smart b1 is, its role in oncogenesis is quite uh, well established it's a part of the sweet sniff uh, uh, complex and it has its cousins uh, smart a4 smart c1 and smart c2 and these are involved in uh, various pathways related to uh, chromatin remodeling and loss of e i1 or smart b1 is associated with overexpression of easy to stone methyl transferases and it is this part is important because uh, there are some targeted uh, uh, inhibitors of easy 2 easy h2 which are uh, now in clinical trials uh, which may be uh, an important targeted uh, important target for uh, these tumors. So I9-1 deficient tumors we have known. Uh, this list is uh, uh, ever expanding. Uh, the, the other tumors which are I9-1 deficient are the epithelioid sarcomas of soft tissues, uh, CNS atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, renal medullary carcinomas, uh, rhabdoid tumors, uh, pediatric rhabdoid tumors, uh, epithelioid malignant uh, peripheral nerve sheet tumors, myopithelial carcinomas, extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcomas. These are tumors uh, which show I1 deficiency and now uh, SMART-B1 deficient uh, cytonasal carcinoma is also added to this list. And uh, I'll share some cases with from our, from, uh, uh, our hospital and uh, this is the, the vast majority of these tumors show basaloid or blue cell appearance uh, with increased mitosis and if you you can see there is hardly any differentiation the tumor cells are not as monotonous as the as the nut carcinoma but they are quite undifferentiated and they show a lot of mitosis uh, this this is the other uh, much more uh, diagnostically uh, significant but not as common as the basaloid appearance. Uh, presence of rhabdoid cells is a very important morphologic clue uh, to, to do INI1 uh, immunohistochemistry. But um, as we can see, they are not present in all the tumor cells. In many of the tumor cells, we'll find only focal uh, presence of rhabdoid cells and in a, in a, in a biopsy where sampling may be an issue. We may not uh, get rhabdoid cells, so it is important to include INI1 uh, in the immunohistochemistry panel of all undifferentiated uh, or hybrid uh, uh, tumors, cellular tumors of sinonasal tract. So tumors can show mixed histology, they can show areas of necrosis, undifferentiated appearance, and then it can show these vacuoles or these um, ill-formed glands as well, which is quite uncommon. But uh, 
peculiarly glandular differentiation is also identified in a, in some of the i9 one deficient tumors and this is an area of intense uh, um, uh, focus and uh, then there are cases where you may find only very scattered rhabdoid cells but it's important to be aware of the spectrum of this tumor uh, so so that we can pick it up and uh, pick it up on morphology and again some of the tumors can show focal clear cell or a microcystic change some of sometimes these tumors can show a lot of myxoid stroma as well um, here uh, they can show, they are showing a lot of myxoid stroma uh, surface colonization uh, is again a regular feature and many of the hybrid uh, undifferentiated tumors or cyanonasal tract tend to colonize or, uh, or have a pagetoid kind of spread uh, surface it is it's an observation not specific to any particular uh, entity so i1 uh, diffuse loss is uh, the diagnostic marker for this uh, uh, for making this diagnosis uh, a1 a3 or cytokeratins are positive in all the cases in all our cases they were positive p40 uh, was positive in half the cases uh, some focal ck7 positivity was observed in cases uh, some cases uh, uh, about 12% which were uh, especially in the cases which were showing glandular differentiation uh, synapto Pycin weak focal patchy positivity uh, can be seen in a minority of cases, and this uh, so it's important not to if we don't include I I one in the panel, we may end up calling these uh, as uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas, especially if P forty is negative. Not was negative in all our cases. And P16 can show positivity uh, in some of these cases, and in one of our cases it was positive, CD34 was positive in one case, so S100 was negative in all the cases. So uh, this is it's important to know that the normal cells, stromal cells, lymphocytes, uh, endothelial cells, they will be positive for INI1, or they will retain INI1, and to call it uh, tumor, the, all the tumor cells, uh, to show it, to call it INI1 lost, uh, deficient tumor, I I one needs to be lost in all the tumor cells. So moving to case number four, uh, this is a 32 year old male uh, from West Bengal, farmer by occupation with a nasal mass, uh, cigarette smoker. And uh, he had an anterior nasal mass which was eroding the nasal cartilage and he underwent a total rhinectomy and the maxillectomy and the we uh, here can see the tumor again another uh, blue round cell tumor but what is striking at this power is that uh, although there are same types of tumor cells all throughout what we see is the pattern the pattern of tumor cells is that they are nested and they are there are these anastomosing nests and this this uh, delicate fibrous bands in between the nests here we see in the close-up part these nests which tend to become confluent at places and these uh, tumor cells are showing some prominence of the peripheral, uh, perif perif at the periphery or the peripheral rimming of these nests. So there is a nested and a lobular architecture and a uh, and uh, uh, eosinophilic pinkish uh, stroma, collagenous stroma separating these nests. Again, another, and if you see these round cells uh, or these blue basaloid cells are quite monomorphic. There is hardly any other differentiation. Within these nests, uh, you have single type of population of cells which are round or uh, blue in appearance. Uh, they may be interpreted as basaloid or they may be interpreted as round cells. And uh, another part which shows these monotonous uh, blue cells with the uh, and here we see that the mitosis is readily identifiable um, another area where these nests have become much more confluent but what is interesting is from some uh, cyst like spaces which are filled with this follicle like uh, spaces with pale fluid and uh, another area to just to show that the cells are quite monotonous they are not very pleomorphic and if we can remember the first case of not carcinoma this is quite uh, similar to that but but much more regular and much more nested in appearance again another some of the nests are much more elongated and becoming more more like tragically um, so what is our diagnosis in this uh, the histology features are of a nested lobular pattern basaloid tumor with monotonous cells some hint of palisading or prominence of the peripheral uh, cells and interlobular stromal fibrosis 
Again, this tumor is also cytokeratin positive. If you see the tumor cells are quite cytokeratin positive, and if you can see here, appreciate that there are a lot of uh, follicle-like spaces here in this area. Uh, CK7 is negative, and again, this tumor is also diffuse P40 positive, and uh, so we do not, and we find that the tumor cells are negative for not. So what could this be? So we run uh, more IC uh, markers and we find that the neuroendocrine markers synaptophysin chromogranin are negative. Synaptophysin is weak and focal. Uh, Desmin uh, for my, my muscle marker is negative. S100 is negative. Uh, CKIT is patchy moderate. P16 was again patchy weak, 20% non-specific. I91 was retained and calretinin is negative. So uh, then the marker which uh, lit up the whole tumor was uh, MIG2 or CD99 and we can see that the tumor cells are strongly positive, membrane is positive for MIG2. So it is not the non-specific positivity which you can see in a variety of tumors in the form of cytoplasmic positivity. But here we see nice membrane positivity which is typical, which is quite characteristic of the Ewing's uh, family of tumors. And here we see a tumor which is like a carcinoma cytokeratin positive and shows membranous mid to or CD99 positivity. So what is this tumor? Uh, so fish was done in this case and it was found to show this kind of uh, uh, EWS R1 break apart rearrangement and we, we see that there is there are uh, there is break apart and uh, so their EWS uh, rearrangement was seen. So this is a tumor which is adamantinoma-like Ewing family of tumor. And what is this tumor? Uh, this is like the Ewing sarcoma. It is also it shows the same translocations defined is defined by EWS R1 ETS related fusions. EWS fly one would be uh, positive in these. And the histology of this overlaps with other more undifferentiated small brown cell tumors, uh, but it shows features of uh, cyto diffuse cytokeratin positivity, P40 positivity, as well as uh, uh, MIG2 positivity. So it has an overlapping uh, uh, histology with uh, carcinoma and uh, small brown cell tumors. But by translocations, it is related to eating uh, sarcoma family. So approximately hidden neck is one of the sites where this is this can be uh, seen and uh, uh, we have seen cases in the sinonasal, parotid, thyroid and orbit and uh, the differential diagnosis will vary depending upon the location uh, of this tumor. So in the sinonasal location there are a whole lot of different differential diagnoses. It can be mistaken for a carcinoma on one hand and round cell tumor on the other hand. And because in sinonasal, sinonasal uh, location you get to see a lot of carcinomas in round cell tumors, a whole lot of uh, uh, the list is quite long. Uh, but because of its blue appearance, it can look and cytokeratin P40 positivity can be mistaken for basaloid squamous carcinoma, polydifferentiated squamous carcinoma, nut carcinoma, uh, INI1 deficient carcinoma, HPV multiphenotypic sinonasal carcinoma, sinonasal neuroendocrine carcinoma, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, solid adenoid cystic carcinoma, and ameloblastic carcinoma. So these are the carcinomas with which it can it can um, have a histologic overlap and it can mimic them. And on the other hand, it can look like round cell tumors. Uh, and in this location, the differentials would be neuroblastoma, melanoma, uh, solid uh, alveolar RMS, or rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, a poorly differentiated uh, sinovel sarcoma. So uh, if we go to the thyroid, if this tumor is identified in the thyroid, uh, it can mimic a poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma or a medullary thyroid carcinoma and carcinoma with thymus-like elements. Uh, this is a case in seven-year-old uh, uh, patient with uh, thyroid mass. And here, we, here you can appreciate uh, the nested architecture and you have tumor cells which are blue, round, and fairly monotonous, but having a very, very uh, characteristic nested appearance and you can see this kind of follicle like spaces where the follicles the whole lining is replaced by 
you know, innovating in manner or in a pejetoid manner. Uh, they are replacing the normal follicular lining and uh, forming a collar around these follicles. Uh, very, very uh, monotonous blue round cells, not, no, no ATP, no anaplasia or pleomorphism to say. And you have these uh, uh, follicular colloid uh, here, and these are uh, nested in appearance. Another area you can see some calcification, uh, monomorphic appearance, and some peripheral uh, rimming, uh, not very conspicuous, uh, but in some of the uh, areas at the end, you can appreciate that. So again, uh, to uh, repeatedly emphasize the nested architecture, uh, which is a very helpful clue. Uh, this is another case in the parotid, and here we can see a tumor which is uh, fairly circumscribed but not encapsulated. And we see a nested architecture. And what is striking even at this part is uh, that there is some keratinization. So if we uh, recall the first case, uh, this is something that uh, would make me prompt me to do uh, a not immunohistochemistry because of this abrupt uh, uh, squamous keratinization, squamous differentiation and uh, these nests of round cells. So, uh, so this is a case again which very similar to not carcinoma but here and you can see a lot as well. So, so these are quite similar looking tumors but here the tumor uh, pleomorphism is not, uh, the tumor cells are not very undifferentiated in appearance but very monotonous and almost like a even round cell a tumor. So nests, nests of tumor cells with, with very collagenous desmoplast have a nice stroma. And here you see uh, the characterization, again, quite abrupt, can be uh, quite extensive. And if we see something like this, we may call it a squamous carcinoma. So we have to be careful uh, what type of cells do we have in uh, squamous uh, in, in this tumor. So here we have another area, tumor cells don't, they do, do look very uniform uh, and uh, almost like evings and then you have an island of uh, squamous uh, differentiation. So here this is cytokeratin, oh sorry, this is MIG2. So MIG2 can be positive in PSP40 is uh, diffusely positive. So if we do not do MIG2, we, we may end up calling this as a squamous carcinoma because these are cytokeratin positive and these are uh, squamous marker positive, E40 positive. And MIG2 is, if you don't include MIG2, we may uh, altogether miss it. So in the parotid of the salivary glands, it can, uh, the differentials are solid adenoid cystic carcinoma, basal cell adenocarcinoma, and a high-grade myopithelial carcinoma. And in the orbit, uh, uh, you can have uh, uh, salivary gland type uh, tumors in the lacrimal. In the, the eyelid, you can have basaloid carcinoma and sebaceous uh, carcinoma. So because of the, its appearance with uh, uh, carcino like carcinoma and round cell tumors, it has a whole lot of uh, differentials that we have to work through. So uh, finally, the histology of adamantinoma like giving uh, uh, sarcoma is a nested lobular pattern, which is a very important clue. Uh, basaloid cells or monotonous evings like cells Palisading, uh, if we are lucky, if we, if we can find palisading, that's an important clue. Uh, interlobular stromal fibrosis, with these nests are separated by this kind of fibrosis. Uh, one of the pitfalls is that these tumors can show keratinization and a lot of squamous differentiation, and um, they can also show petatoid intrapidermal spread, so those can be pitfalls. So basic IC panel for any uh, poorly differentiated basaloid tumor would include uh, A1, A3, and P40 or P63, CD99, MIG2, NUT, P16, I1, uh, looking for loss, and S100. So this is uh, a very basic panel uh, that we employ for all poorly differentiated basaloid tumors uh, in head and neck. Uh, if we get a1, A3, and P40 or P63 uh, possibility is of basaloid carcinoma, but we should go ahead and uh, do the not. And uh, if the morphology prompts and also taking the clinical picture into account, and uh, if not is positive, then it, it is called not carcinoma. And if with the same uh, histology, similar histology of undifferentiated cells, cytokeratin positive, E40 positive, I9 one is lost, then it is called as a smart B1 deficient cyanonizal carcinoma. 
And if we have a 1A3B40 positivity and the rest of the features are like a salivary gland tumor, uh, we can go ahead and do T16 positivity. And if it is diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic and shows uh, myopithelial uh, phenotype as well, myopithelial marker positivity as well, then we should go ahead and uh, suspect HPV multifenotypic uh, uh, cyanonasal carcinoma and confirm it with HPV typing specific uh, testing s100 positivity uh, uh, we, we suspect melanoma then and we do specific markers for melanoma in the form of hmb45 melani or sox10 mitf so same if we get a1 a3 positivity or p40 positivity and in combination with that we get a membranous mic 2 positivity uh, we have to entertain this differential diagnosis of adamantinoma possibility of adamantinoma like evening sarcoma so um, not much is known about the biology of this it is supposed to be or is it is what the report early reports are indicating that it is a little better or indolent than a conventional living sarcoma but right now uh, these are being treated like uh, with specific chemotherapy protocols of uh, evenings uh, and they may have different uh, therapeutic regimens like than the other conventional uh, squamous carcinomas or other tumors. The molecular studies for evening sarcomas are necessary for this and for any poorly differentiated undifferentiated head neck uh, tumor with nuclear monotony and C CD99 immunoreactivity, even in the presence of strong cytokeratin expression or uh, keratinization, we should order uh, and confirm with EWSR1 rearrangement. So going to the case number five, which is a 38-year-old male with epistaxis and uh, cyanonasal mass and intracranial extension. Uh, now this is the low part uh, which shows uh, a tumor with, with very, again, a kind of lobulated appearance or larger nest of uh, blue cells in a way fibrovascular kind of a stroma at places that uh, stroma is quite edematous and here we see that uh, the tumor is showing large uh, cysts filled with fluid uh, and uh, again a tumor is so there are blue or uh, cellular blue areas and if we look at the, uh, the higher magnification we find these kind of very blue round cells um, again very undifferentiated looking uh, cells with uh, at some places these are clustered together in a very patternless manner here and uh, we try to make sense of what is going on here and in some areas we start getting uh, them they are forming more confluent sheets and here we do find that they are forming this kind of a very stout uh, these stout glands and here there is a nest of uh, some epithelial cells here also we can appreciate some epithelial uh, area again uh, area which is uh, becoming very heterogeneous from those uh, nested areas we have uh, now starting to see some uh, spindle cells here and they are blending with these very undifferentiated uh, blue round cells and this kind of very clustering of these blue round cells uh, which we uh, try to figure out what they are and then in some areas we find there are these units of uh, of uh, 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 nested units which show this kind of if you look at the towards the center of this uh, that this luminal uh, lumina is uh, rimmed by uh, cells which are more eosinophilic and epithelial appearing and then you have a peripheral more undifferentiated peanut like um, neuroectodermal like cells and then you have uh, so what is this tumor which is showing a lot of uh, a variety of areas areas of it uh, uh, Peanut like areas or neuroectodermal like areas, undifferentiated round cell areas, some epithelial areas, uh, some uh, glands, and some uh, hybrid areas. Uh, so, other areas that we see, then again, there are these uh, almost something that you see in, uh, in uh, immature teratoma, some kind of uh, neural tubules or immature neuroepithelium like appearance. Then we see here uh, in this area, we are seeing the tumor is becoming pretty sarcomatous or the spindle component is becoming more and more cellular. And there are these islands of cells which have these. Uh, um, 
brown cells admixed with some squamous appearing cells and this kind of uh, glandular unit so some kind of squamous glandular units with admix with intermixed uh, round cells uh, or primitive uh, undifferentiated cells uh, and uh, outside in the in the surrounding stroma you have cells which are sarcomatous again so this kind of heterogeneity a lot of uh, different things happening in the same tumor is is very very uh, striking in this again you see more epithelial differentiation and then you have these primitive uh, round cells and uh, you have these kind of uh, palisading of these uh, primitive epithelium and again you have these kind of rosettes areas of necrosis sheets of uh, yeah, primitive neuroectodermal cells then you have uh, right in the middle of this uh, a gland which is uh, there and when you do immunohistochemistry you find that those nests uh, with blue round cells are highlighted with synaptophysin and in that uh, whole uh, uh, nested unit and the central part is highlighted by cell K7 and cytokeratin showing an epithelial or a ductal kind of a differentiation and then you see those uh, within those primitive neuroectodermal uh, nodules you have these uh, glands strike, strike, striking glands glandular differentiation uh, highlighted by a1 a3 again ck7 is showing positivity and in the stroma you find uh, this kind of desmen positivity as well uh, in some of the tumor cells uh so this is a tumor which is showing a lot of uh, divergent differentiation and is a tumor which is quite unique uh, in location to sinonasal region and this is called as a sinonasal teratocarcinosarcoma um this is again a lot of a lot is going on in this tumor uh, in terms of uh, identify trying to unravel its molecular uh, underpinnings but uh to uh, this is a tumor which is also very under recognized so i'm going to focus on mainly morphology uh about this tumor is this is a unique sinonasal tumor uh, supposedly it is quite aggressive in majority of the cases that we see uh neuroepithelial and neuroectodermal elements is one of the component second component is epithelial a component which can be benign or malignant and a mesenchymal uh, third component which can be benign or malignant so there are three components uh, in a in a tumor which you can if you have a complete tumor which is uh, rarely the situation and um, so these are some of the other tumors uh, we that we have seen here where you can get to see a lot of nodular architecture and if you get a thymonasal mass or a, or a, or a mass near the cribriform plate or the skull base you would think that this is an esthesio neuroblastoma or a neuro and to try in a type of a tumor with this kind of lobulated uh, architecture and um, uh, so this more one of the common differentials in in a biopsy is uh, a high grade or fat uh neuroblastoma uh here uh, the tumor is much more solid and sheeted uh and confluent and then here you may think of a sinonasal neuroectodermal neuro neuroendocrine chroma and these are other images of the of these uh, this entity where you can have uh, nodules becoming much more confluent or maybe quite uh, in large number of areas showing the round cells or blue round appearance primitive neuroectodermal kind of an appearance or it can be very esthesio like lobulated with a fibrovascular stroma and in other areas it can show a very swiss cheese kind of an appearance with a lot of uh, glandular or follicle like uh, lumina uh, punctuating these uh, uh, cellular nodules of blue round cells so again these are quite characteristic you find these sarcomatous areas intermingling with these primitive blue round cells and these may be lined in on the inside by glandular cells or or epithelial cells and then you have these units or these nests of uh, of a combination of these epithelial and neuroectodermal cells again very undifferentiated blue round cells if you get only biopsy from this we would start working it up as a pnet or eving sarcoma rhabdo and so on and um, uh, again uh, this uh, 
So we can see adaptive myoplastics. So this it knees and camel component can be sarcomatous. It can be like an immature teratoma, immature knees and kind like. And uh, you can see rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma. And it depends upon what kind of biopsy you get or what sample you get, where you may get only an area where which is showing either an even sarcoma like area or or a rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma like area and uh, it can happen with this tumor that depending upon what what was sampled a diagnosis pre operative diagnosis uh, may vary so one of the key is if if uh, if the tumor is quite heterogeneous if it is showing if a lot is happening in the same tumor if you have a lot of stromal elements and the stroma is very um, immature knees and kind like so those are some of the clues that this may not be a simple rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma or nevings or an olfactory neuroblastoma and that is when we have to start digging and uh, looking very carefully to see if these are there are some glandular elements or some squam squamous elements and one of the very important or very diagnostic clue is the presence of fetal uh, squamous uh, islands uh, which which I can um, uh, we, which we will see in the subsequent slides so again in the in the uh, sarcomatous component you can see rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma you can also see some strap cells rab rhabdomyoma like cells and they can show desmin and myogen and positivity Smooth muscle bundles, you can see, you can see osteosarcomatous uh, differentiation, you can see a lot of uh, vascular proliferation, hemangioma-like areas, you can see a non, uh, not otherwise specified uh, sarcomatous uh, stroma with, with here you can see some uh, calcified uh, ker keratin material and then you can have uh, any undifferentiated hydrate sarcoma-like uh, area. Again, like other high-grade uh, sinonasal uh, malignancies, this also tends to show uh, pagetoid spread along the mucosa. Uh, this is one of our case where you where we had a preoperative uh, uh, round blue cells, uh, very primitive. Uh, where there was a predominant uh, uh, primitive neuroectodermal component. And after chemotherapy, induction chemotherapy, it showed a lot of uh, glial maturation, the neuroectodermal component underwent uh, maturation and showed these immature ganglioid cells and a lot of uh, glial differentiation. So th radiologically, they may not be uh, too much regression, but sometimes uh, there is uh, neuronal maturation that can be seen with chemotherapy. Uh, the diagnostic dilemma is mainly because of the sampling. And because this tumor is inherently heterogeneous and uh, the sampling can introduce uh, uh, is the limitation and uh, olfactory, it can be mistaken for olfactory neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, even squamous carcinoma, mucopidermoid carcinoma, uh, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma and SNEC. Uh, one of the important clues is the heterogeneous mixture of tissues. You can find primitive neuroectodermal or neuroepithelial tissue, immature mesenchyme, fetal squamous, uh, benign and malignant epithelial cells surrounded by undifferentiated cells and sarcomatous elements. Um, recently, it has been uh, shown that these tumors may they are associated with underlying uh, alterations in smart a4 which is a cousin of uh, uh, smart b1 and uh, this is an area of active research and on immunohistochemistry they show a loss of smart a4 either a complete loss or a partial loss and uh, it so this is an interesting entity and uh, and it is very under recognized so it is important to keep in mind these these uh, features um, case six is a different uh, we take a different direction now this is a 14 year old boy with a parotid mass and what this uh, uh, tumor showed was was these large lobules of tumor lobules which in within that showed uh, uh, with, uh, a microcystic architecture so or a follicle like spaces and uh, if you see and within these you have these kind of bubbly secretions and if you look at the cells they are quite Land in appearance and they have these kind of abundant cytoplasm, eosinophilic pale pink cytoplasm. And if you look at individual cells, there is hardly any cytologic anaplasia. 
and they are quite gland looking cells but what is characteristic is this kind of these kind of uh, follicle like spaces or microcystic uh, spaces with these kind of bubbly uh, secretions uh, so uh, we do cytokeratin and these are positive for cyt cytokeratin 7 these are positive for S100 and because of this appearance one of the differential diagnosis is asthenic uh, carcin cell carcinoma. For that, we do dog one, and it is negative. And T sixty three or myopathy mycopid or more carcinoma marker or a marker of myopathy cells P sixty three and P forty are negative. So this is uh, a secretory carcinoma of the parotid. Uh, this was previously uh, called as mammary analog secretory carcinoma. Uh, now it has been the terminology has been revised to secretory carcinoma. And it is again a, a carcinoma which is translocation uh, associated and it is uh, the transcript is ATV6 NTRK3 and uh, this is important to know that in, uh, there are a whole lot of uh, NTRK um, uh, uh, fusion uh, malignancies and one of these secretory carcinoma is one of them and th this has gained importance in the recent times is because uh, there are inhibitors which are available against uh, NTRAC so uh, so it becomes very, even more important in cases which are which require uh, targeted therapy so uh, the morphologic features are it is a bland tumors are usually bland eosinophilic cells they can show microcystic architecture like the one I showed and they can also show a papillary architecture and uh, they typically show secretions which are very bubbly in appearance and on immunohistochemistry they show diffuse S100 and SOX10 positivity and also show mar uh, mammary uh, markers which are positive one is the GCDFP uh, gross cystic disease fluid protein 15 and GATA3 which are markers of uh, which can be seen in breast carcinomas mammoglobin is another marker which is uh, seen in breast carcinoma and is positive in these tumors so like breast uh, they do show positivity for um, breast markers but they are negative for ER and PR and androgen receptors uh, and other, other markers are MAC4 and STAT5A which are quite um, strongly diffusely positive in these tumors. Uh, IHC for trick uh, is also available now and uh, these tumors are TAN, uh, TRIC, uh, IHC positive and these are negative for myopithelial markers so they on one hand these can be confused with uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma or myopithelial uh, carcinoma um, rarely and uh, but the most common differential diagnosis and from which this entity was curated out is uh, called out was as an excel carcinoma and if this entity is uh, in um, is negative for markers of um, uh, acinar cell markers the dog one <clears throat> this is another case uh, which is showing a more papillary architecture but if you see this these tumors are more pink and uh, they are polygonal cells with bland uh, cytology again so this is also a common architecture papillary architecture and again very bubbly uh, cytoplasm and uh, cytoplasmic uh, bubbly secretions so this is uh, another part which is showing a low part where they can, it is locally infiltrative uh, overall circumscribed but it shows areas of uh, infiltration and again a tumor can form these kind of cystic nodules with filled with papillary tumor and uh, these uh, follicle or microcystic architecture or these follicular spaces filled with secretions are quite characteristic and these are the diagnostic hallmark and uh, it's important to differentiate it from acinic cell carcinoma with which it uh, its morphology overlaps another again the bland cytology is something which is very striking so like i showed in adenoid cystic carcinoma mask can also undergo high grade transformation rarely where uh, conventional mask like a uh, mask morphology can be seen uh, juxtaposed to a high grade uh, histology with increased mitosis and um, high grade uh, and nuclear pleomorphism and necrosis so S100 uh, is a simple state which will come diffusely positive. 
and uh, so that is one interesting entity which is translocation associated and as far as the biology is concerned uh, compared to arsenic which is quite uh, indolent this uh, vast majority are indolent and have a favorable prognosis however in, in uh, some cases some unpredictable biology has been seen and increased uh, and a progressive uh, relentless disease has been seen so the biology of secreted carcinoma of uh, celebrity glands is, uh, is not very clear right now <clears throat> and rarely a secretory carcinoma can, uh, has been reported in thyroid as well so that is also an interesting uh, um, in uh, that is also a very interesting histology in thyroid um, Going to case seven, which is a 41 year old male with nasal obstruction. And here we see that the surface is keratinized. And what we see the tumor is uh, composed or it's a, in the biopsy shows a tumor, which is composed. It's quite a uh, uh, at, uh, biopsy shows uh, completely filled with these pink and blue uh, cells. And what we can see here are these uh, kind of dolphins. These are actually invaginated. Uh, epithelial uh, cells, lining cells, and here we see the cell, the stroke, it's a, it's a, the parenchyma is completely filled with tumor. And if you look at the closer part, we find that the tumor is actually spindle here and is arranged in the form of fascicles. And uh, these are those uh, dolphins on the higher part, we see these are invaginated <laughs> surface epithelium bang within the within the meat of the tumor and what we find is that the tumor is composed of these spindle cells and, and uh, there is uh, no striking anaplasia in these tumor cells and these tumor cells are spindle again uh, imaginated uh, benign epithelium uh, seen quite uh, regularly in most of the sections here Again, you have this undisturbed uh, invaginated epithelium, respiratory epithelium, and surrounding that there is a there are fascicles of these spindle cells, which are quite uh, monomorphic or low grade in appearance. And here, if you see the tumor appears, the cytoplasm is quite pinkish and they look quite myoid. And in other areas, they appear to show some palisading, but uh, uh, again, more fascicular and cellular. Here also, the tumor is more cellular. <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, devoid of too many mitosis or cellular pleomorphism. And uh, again, another hyperview, cells are quite uh, uniform in appearance and quite monomorphic. Um, some HPC-like uh, vascularity, hematopericyte cytoma like these angulated open patent uh, so is it uh, a hematopericytoma, cytonasal hematopericytoma? So what is the diagnosis? So here we see that the MIG2 is positive. Uh, S100, if we see a neural marker, is diffusely positive. Is it a melanoma? Uh, again, a, uh, S100 diffusely positive. And what we see, lo and behold, that smooth muscle actin is also quite strongly positive in most of the areas, especially the ones which looked myoid. So this is again another recent entity, which is biphenotypic cyanonasal sarcoma. And uh, again, the pathologic features of these are, this is a cellular spindle cell neoplasm with an infiltrative growth and does not show much pleomorphism. And uh, one of the good diagnostic uses is imaginated benign epithelium deep within the, uh, the tumor. Um, and the immunohistochemistry shows, like the name suggests, it is biphenotypic. It shows neural and myoid differentiation. So S100 is nearly always positive. SOX10 uh, or S100, they are focal or diffuse. Then myoid markers, smooth muscle actin or MSA are the focal or diffuse positive in vast majority in these tumors. So these are tumors which are typically low grade in appearance and show uh, myoid and neural differentiation. And these are associated with beta catenin mutations. Uh, these are beta catenin positive and they are 90% uh, of the tumor cells will show beta catenin positivity. And uh, some positivity with CD34 can be posit, uh, seen, with focal desmond positivity or EMA positivity can be seen and uh, this can be important when we are distinguishing it from uh, solid fi solitary fibrous tumor which can be, which is usually diffuse positive. But 
this combination of neural and muscle markers is 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 a big game away uh, now these are translocation uh, associated sarcomas and these have a pax3 mammal3 fusion uh, uh, <coughs> translocation and uh, the, the fusion partner with PAX3 can vary uh, but uh, and there are many tumors which have unidentified partners. Uh, we have immunohistochemistry available commercially now for PAX3 which can help in diagnosis and it is uh, reported to be quite specific and uh, the ICs which are negative and because of its morphology the differential diagnosis mainly range from uh, mangioparasitoma, uh, sino sarcoma, monophasic synovial sarcoma, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor and other neural and small muscle tumors. So uh, uh, immunohistochemistry plays an important role. EMA BCL2 is negative in this, P63, CD34 uh, in majority of the tumor, uh, Desmin, Caldesmon, HMB45 and SOX10 are negative. So. So these are the differentials, schwannoma, MPL, neural tumors, glomangioparasitoma, sinonasal hemangioparasitoma, uh, solitary fibrous tumor, synovial sarcoma. These uh, require a panel of immunohistochemistry where biphenotypic is positive for both S100 and SNA. I would like to add melanoma also in this differential diagnosis because melanoma uh, uh, can be spin very spindle, it can show any kind of morphology. So these are usually low-grade uh, uh, overall indolent behavior, but there can be recurrences and local infiltration uh, can be seen. Uh, uh, no distant metastasis has been reported to date. So uh, Sanjati, please let me know whenever I have to stop because I can go on. Ma'am, I think it's fine, ma'am. Well, you can go on, ma'am. It's very okay. interesting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So uh, this is a case, a case six is a 17 year old boy with nasal mass and here you can see multiple fragments again this also looks like a, some spindle tumor or let's see what it is and here we find that uh, uh, the fragments show a lot of uh, it's a busy uh, busy fragment with a lot of infiltrate and if we look at the infiltrate we find that there is there are these spindle cells or uh, fibroblastic uh, appearing cells that mix with a lot of inflammatory infiltrate and if we look at the inflammatory infiltrate that is uh, mainly plasma cells if you see the dominant uh, in inflammatory cells here are infiltrating cells or plasma cells and these are intermixed with these very cellular plump uh, fibroblast appearing uh, appearing uh, spindle cells which are not showing much in cellular anaplasia and here we again see uh, very plump prominent fibroblastic uh, proliferation and mixed with uh, plasma cells and uh, diagnosis uh, everything whether it is just a non-specific inflammation what could it be inflammatory pathology and then we uh, because of the combination of this kind of fibroblast uh, very plump cellular fibrosis and plasma cells we go ahead and do immunostains for uh, IgG and a subtype of uh, IgG which is IgG4 and we find that uh, the plasma cells are, which are positive for IgG, the a vast majority of them, almost uh, all of them are positive for IgG4 also. So these are IgG4 positive plasma cells seen here. So, uh, so this is an entity uh, called as the IgG4 sclerosing disease. It is a um, uh, disease which can be which has been described or reported in uh, practically all the organs of the body. And uh, the 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 important thing is that this can present clinically and on imaging like a tumor mass, and it can be a big mass like or a tumefactive uh, lesion. And they would be, you and what happens is we tend to get biopsy, which we continue to report as inflammatory pathology, uh, non-specific inflammation, plasma cell rich infiltrate and uh, it is so important to recognize that uh, these lesions, uh, if, we, if we see, look at the specific features, we can come to a, di a specific diagnosis which, which is very important from a treatment point of view. Many these patients can go on without a diagnosis for for many years, and uh, uh, and with with a simple uh, steroid therapy, these can be completely uh, the tumors can vanish. Um, 
so uh, it's important that we make this diagnosis and the diagnostic features are uh, story form fibrosis in a typical case we can we can get to see a story form fibrosis uh, and usually the fibrosis is uh, is cellular and more plump uh, fibroblasts are seen um, uh, and then you can see plasma cells uh, obliterating the uh, uh, veins and uh, it, uh, this is a feature which you may not see in all the cases but should definitely be looked for and uh, elastic stains should be done to specifically look for because these vessels are unrecognizable they are like nodular masses uh, filled with uh, uh, lymphocytes and uh, so tumor and the a third component is the plasma cell rich infiltrate so story form fibrosis plasma cell rich infiltrate and an obliterative phlebitis is a tribe which uh, which makes uh, uh, which are the, which is characteristic for idt for sclerosing disease and they they form these tumor like masses and synonasal location and practically uh, salivary gland and synonasal uh, location scan have these kind of mass like lesions which uh, which go on and are dependent on the pathologist for the final diagnosis so the number of igg4 positive cells is variable it can in the different sites different cutoffs have been offered uh but uh, they are usually per hyperfill if, if you find more than 10 uh, igg4 positive cells more uh, more significant or more valuable is the ratio of igg4 to igg uh, positive plasma cells if the ratio is more than 40% it is uh, quite diagnostic it is uh, suggestive of uh, igg4 and uh, uh, the other histologic features so isolated uh, presence of just increased igg4 positive plasma cells is not diagnostic it has to be taken in uh, uh, in conjunction with other histologic features like fibrosis which is story form and uh, obliterative phlebitis uh, if it is present then it is very characteristic the primary glands require more much more number of uh, igg4 positive plasma cells to to call it uh, uh, igg4 sclerosing disease and the important thing why i am emphasizing is that these patients can uh, uh, they continue to receive a non diagnostic uh, report from the pathologist it's important to recognize these uh, features because these tumor these tumor like lesions respond show an excellent or a dramatic response to to steroids uh, and also uh, rituximab or anti cd20 antibodies so so these patients can uh, get very quick relief uh, if they are diagnosed properly so i think this is the last case of a uh, of an 11 year old uh, uh, boy who had uh, who when he was 3 years ago started uh, developing a slow growing mass uh, he had difficulty in uh, stand, deformities in both the legs and he was a very neglected child from a very poor socio economic strata and ever since uh, this slow growing mass in the jaws was uh, noticed uh, which progressively uh, but slowly increased uh he was neglected and he was malnourished and ultimately he had difficulties in feeding and uh, as a result uh, there was malnourishment and this mass almost reached the size of 10 cm and involved the upper uh, maxillofacial bones as well as the lower jaw uh, had another 5 cm mass so this is a picture uh, uh, when this patient presented to us he uh, he had a, a multiple uh, upper and lower jaw uh, uh, lesions in and as well as he had this kind of very bent uh, deformity almost devoid of any mineralization of bones uh, investigations apart from reflecting uh, uh, malnourishment showed uh, low serum uh, uh, serum calcium serum phosphorus and vitamin d levels and had a high alkaline phosphatase levels uh, serum parathyroid levels were uh, were elevated uh, however the parathyroid glands were normal uh, this excision for of this mass was uh, uh, done partial excision was debulking was done and it was a hard uh, fibrous uh, very gritty and uh, hard uh, tumor and this this is the uh, the histology at low part you can see that the native uh, bone is almost uh, uh, at some places it is completely disappeared and this is again a pink uh, fibrous lesion and here you can see some uh, basophilic uh, matrix like material 
and here we see that the most of the lesion is uh, fibroblastic composed of uh, quiescent looking uh, fibroblastic uh, spindle cells and we have these uh, basophilic uh, uh, material which uh, with the with eosinophilic uh, rimmed border without any osteoblasts and again you have this uh, another view uh, here is a high power view the cells the stromal cells are quite bland fibroblastic in appearance and then you have this kind of basophilic material with uh, with a peripheral uh, hyalinization at the end of this material so this was a, a, a diagnosis um, of a gigantiform a gigantiform cemento ossifying fibroma and uh, if you look at the fibrooosseous lesions of the head and neck uh, they are of three major categories so fibrous dysplasia ossifying fibroma and uh, cemento osseous uh, dysplasia and uh, the cemento ossifying fibrom fibromas are uh, non odontogenic uh, tumor benign tumors of maxillofacial bones which arise from the periodontal ligaments and they have these fibroblastic proliferation uh, admixed with the uh, cementum uh, like substance and uh, usually these are single lesions but uh, here we had a patient who had these uh, multiple lesions and um, uh, here this patient uh, this uh, this uh, this condition of familial gigantiform cementoma is associated with autosomal dominant uh, uh, inheritance, multiple tumors, and it shows a very uh, 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 in, in, uh, rare phenomena of calcium steel phenomena, which is uh, show, which shows excessive uh, calcium resorption at one site and excessive deposition of the same at the other site. So the the this tumor was actually resorbing all the uh, calcium in the peripheral bones and depositing at uh, at another site. So this is a very rare case, um, and uh, this was published uh, 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 by uh, Dr. Uh, Subhash Yadav and uh, Neha. And our patients, uh, this patient also had uh, involvement. Uh, the patient's mother also had, uh, when she was investigated, she had multiple small clinically asymptomatic bony lesions. And uh, however, she refused to undergo any kind of uh, further testing. So uh, if I go quickly over the summary of all the cases that we have seen. So this is uh, nut carcinoma is if you see a round undifferentiated cells with abrupt keratinization, not IC and uh, uh, sorry. And then you have uh, uh, HPV related multiphenotypic carcinoma which can be mistaken for salivary gland tumors. Here you have adenoid cystic like uh, or a salivary gland morphology surface or squamous dysplasia and a diffuse P16 positivity. Uh, then you can get uh, high grade transformation in salivary gland tumors at any location uh, where you get to see low grade con conventional salivary gland areas uh, juxtaposed to high grade areas. Uh, then we saw case of uh, smart, uh, cases of smart B1 deficient uh, cyanomasal carcinomas. If we see a basaloid uh, uh, cells uh, combination with the, or uh, rhabdoid cells, the I1 deficient uh, I1 should be done. If there is loss, then this is a smart B1 deficient cyanomasal carcinoma. And then we have uh, uh, basaloid cells in a nested pattern with peripheral palisading and a squamous differentiation in some cases. Uh, apart from cytokeratin and P40 positivity, they show uh, MIG2 membranous positivity, which is a clue, and they show EWS R1 split. Uh, then it is uh, an adamantinoma like Ewing uh, sarcoma. Then a tumor which shows a variety of uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, morphology, uh, mesenchyme, immature mesenchyme like areas, primitive neural ectodermal like areas, some uh, fibrillary areas, uh, epithelial and sarcomatous differentiation. Uh, it, uh, the possibility is that of a cyanonasal teratocarcinosarcoma. And uh, low grade spindle cell tumor with epithelial invaginations as a, uh, as a clue, uh, look for uh, neural and myogenic differentiation. Uh, this could be a biophenotypic cyanonasal sarcoma. Uh, not to forget, 
uh, IgG4 sclerosing disease, if you get plasma cell rich uh, infiltrate and a story form fibrosis, look for obliterative phlebitis. Uh, but even if you don't find do IgG and IgG4, uh, that ratio if is more than 40%, that's a tumor that requires uh, steroids and not surgery. So awareness of these uh, new entities is uh, is important. We may have to look at the same tumors that we have been seeing with a new perspective. And uh, HNE uh, is is it gives very important clues uh, to identify and select cases which would require uh, which can be confirmed on immunohistochemistry. So uh, I want to thank my uh, department, my uh, head and neck pathology colleagues with whom I uh, share a lot of my cases, uh, head and neck disease management group, uh, which provides us very important clinical feedback and keeps us informed of all the latest uh, uh, going on goings on in the patients and my department of pathology uh, at TMH. And, uh, Last but not the least, the patients who, who educate us with their material. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was lovely. That was absolutely so lucid. Um, it was beautiful. Thank you so much. Ma'am, um, these are so interesting and um, they're pretty difficult to pick up. I mean, uh, we tend to believe that uh, it's just head neck, so it's mostly squamous cell carcinoma or it's going to be common salivary gland tumors, but um, I'm sure this lecture is going to go a long way to help us to pick up these difficult cases. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Just so uh, I think just we just have stop presenting so that we can yes. see you. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. You keep encouraging me so much. Thank you, sir. So I'll try. I'll definitely try. So we have a comment from Minesh Gandhi and he says that this is a really nice presentation. I'm sure we all agree. And I'm just a very few questions. I'm sure your voice must need some rest now. But uh, if I could just ask you these uh, few questions. Um, Ma'am, this was uh, from case three that uh, smart B1 deficient carcinoma is believe and Viren Pagasia had asked whether uh, this entity is similar to rhabdoid tumor of infant. So uh, that is correct. It uh, Now smart B1 deficient cyanonasal carcinomas uh, do belong to the same family which is now expanding it uh, and uh, pediatric rhabdoid tumors are a part of uh, uh, INI1 deficient family and so there are a whole lot of uh, tumors especially the soft tissue tumors as well as uh, uh, renal medullary carcinoma and uh, extra there are a whole lot of long list of tumors which I showed that uh, so this uh, they are unified by this uh, alteration and this loss of INI1 deficient and this carcinoma is also part of that family and they are uh, related by this uh, loss of smart P1. Right, right. And um, so Minesh Gandhi has been uh, giving us the answers to uh, several of the cases as in when you've been showing us the pictures. So that was really nice of him. Now he has two questions. One is about uh, the case two, that is the multi, multi phenotypic uh, HPV type. And he has asked whether we can sign out that entity as de-differentiated adeno adenoid cystic carcinoma. That is his question. So, so that's a good question because uh, whenever we see areas of my increased mitosis and uh, um, solid sheeted pattern or uh, an area which is a little more uh, aggressive looking, we do tend to think of uh, hybrid transformation and that is definitely a differential. But uh, if we tend to see that these tumors uh, show a lot of squamous differentiation as well and uh, so so we need to uh, need to do p16 uh, first as a screening marker to show that these are uh, diffusely positive for p16 hybrid transformation on the other end shows very typical areas and mixed with with uh, usually in adenoid cystic carcinoma the hybrid component resembles adenocarcinoma Sometimes it can example uh, in epithelial, myopithelial carcinomas, we have seen a myopithelial uh, type of phenotype, phenotype in the carcinomas. So, so it is, uh, uh, yes, we, when we see the, those areas, 
um, usually they are not associated with too much uh, 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 cytologic anaplasia. They are they are associated with more solid pattern and more increased mitosis, but not too much of uh, cytologic pleomorphism. Uh, whereas in hybrid transformation, the, the transformed area is cytologically and pleomorphic hybrid anaplastic, uh, or much more uh, cytologic anaplasia compared to the low grade uh, component. There's a distinction between the low grade and the uh, hybrid component but the p16 can be done and then if it is diffuse positive uh, we should go for HPV testing whereas a patchy non-specific type of positivity can be seen in um, other cases also yes ma'am and i have another you question can, you can put your video on both of you so that we can see you <laughs> okay 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 the so youtube you people can't see anything all right uh, so that's great yeah i think okay. now Yes, so can you see me now? Uh, sure. I can see you. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, one la uh, another question from Minish Gandhi once again, and uh, this was about case six, which I think is the biphenotypic uh, sinonasal sarcoma, and uh, he has asked whether we should rule out inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor in this case. In the low grade, yes. So uh, all kinds of low grade. It's bigger cell proliferations come into the differential diagnosis. So if you get uh, an inflammatory component as well, which is not so marked in uh, biphenotypic cytonasal sarcoma, but if you get in, inter, uh, intermixing with uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells, then we should, uh, we can do SMA and ALK1. But uh, these tumors, the biphenotypic are usually more cellular. They have more cellular fascicles. In some places, they will look myoid. And they have these typical invaginal um, epithelium which is quite a big clue so and then we can go ahead if we have we can go ahead and confirm with the uh, uh, x3 ihc otherwise these will be positive for s100 and sma but uh, yes we, we we can see a focal s100 and sma positivity with with uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor also but uh, so theoretically yes it is a possibility but most of the times uh, these tumors uh, are not uh, antis are not that cellular uh, they are not these kind of fasciculated uh, tumors so so yes theoretically yes all low grade spindle cell proliferations would come in the differentials and um, if ALK is positive then uh, definitely it favors uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. So some of the cases that we have seen, we have not had uh, differential of IMT, but rather we, differentials are uh, monophasic synovials or MPNSTs uh, or other great uh, spindle cell uh, tumors. So. Okay, so sorry ma'am, I think uh, Minish Gandhi has just, uh, I think he got the case number a little confused with that. He is considering that to be a differential of uh, the next case, which is the tumor like IgG4 sclerosing disease. Yes, uh, yes, yes, that is absolutely correct. IgG4 sclerosing disease, one of the differentials is uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor and it can be difficult uh, when we don't have uh, uh, ALK1, uh, ALK immunohistochemistry positive, uh, then it can be difficult and we need to look for other markers and supportive features as well. So I, that, that is definitely true that uh, these are very strong uh, uh, mimics but most of the time the fibrosis that we see in inflammation in uh, igg for sclerosing disease is quite a uh, story form and the cells are quite spindle cellular there is and there is obliterative flipitis and if you're lucky you can get that so uh, I see them IgG4, which is not a great uh, uh, help in many cases because it's not that sensitive. Uh, but if it is elevated, uh, then uh, two to three times the normal reference range, then it does support the diagnosis. But this is where we have uh, uh, difficulty. These two are differentials, but both of them can be treated with steroids. Uh, so that is one of the, so treatment wise, it doesn't make much difference. Sanjati, you are frozen, so am I, uh, has my internet ditched me? No, 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 um, it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't. 
Okay. Yes, it's working. It's working perfectly fine. Okay, 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 sir. And I think th those are the questions. But ma'am, just uh, one last question, if I may ask. Uh, I, I, you had given a panel of seven markers for all these undifferentiated uh, tumors or sinonasal tumors which you encounter. Ma'am, so do you recommend that we do that panel for each case that we get uh, with undifferentiated cells? I mean, it would really be helpful with that kind of resource. But I just wanted to uh, ask you whether that is what you're doing routinely. So, uh, ideally, yes, but I know with the resource constraints that we have, we can start with cytokeratin. So, that can uh, first and foremost help us if it is a strong diffuse positive. Then we have differentials of uh, of these NUT and, uh, and adenoma like and smart B1 deficient, and at least the E wings and the DAP dose will not have a diffuse cytokeratin melanoma. These won't have. So, we can first start with cytokeratin. And then P40, and then we can work our way slowly, slowly. But uh, having said that, then we have seen cases not all of them will be cytokeratin positive, not all of them will be P40 positive. So, morphology, if you strongly feel, uh, shows some clues, then uh, then we should go ahead and at least include those uh, specific. If you see abrupt keratinization uh, and an aggressive tumor uh, in an of undifferentiated cells not should be included in addition to that. If you don't have that, then at least it should be uh, checked with the clinician what kind of tumor it is and it should be sent to, to a center where it may be. So at least that should be alerted in the in the, in the comment that this may be required. Okay. So, so we can pick up these things. Uh, so these are the cases we, uh, some years ago we have called them squamous carcinoma. And yes. now with the awareness, we are picking them up on morphology and confirming the rest of chemistry. So morphology is still the uh, still the biggest help, but because uh, many times these because of the sampling issue, you may not get those clues. So if you have a totally undifferentiated, no clue, then you would have to increase your panel. But uh, you can start with cytokinetin and P40, go step by step. But it's important to keep all this long list of differentials in mind so that we don't miss out. Yes, ma'am. I'm sure we all are seeing these tumors and calling yes. them uh, something else. Absolutely, absolutely. It was a pleasure uh, uh, to be there and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Uh, the pleasure is all ours. The honor is all mine. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for that was delightful. It was absolutely an enriching uh, presentation. Such a lot of interesting cases and so beautifully presented. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you sir, for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, this was a meeting of a superstar and a superstar in the making. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that is too much. So, um, oh sir, my thank God. you so much. There I do time. My God, do ganta padaya. So nice of you. I'm sorry. Fantastic. No, no, sorry, no, no I'm so happy. Please don't be sorry. Please don't be sorry, ma'am. I was. Wow. Gone on so beautiful. That was beautiful. Uh -huh. <laughs> we really enjoyed every bit of it, and the last part of it was absolutely right. We are all diagnosing something or the other. Yes. And uh, actually, it's something else. That's the truth. So it's an eye opener for all of us. And so before I close, let me thank Sanjuti for taking out time. And thank I you, think we will we would like to have her more and more. And thank you, Dr. Manita. I know you are really busy, very busy, but still you have taken out time and have come and shared your this entire gamut of activities which you people do. So nice of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank Take care. God bless you. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.